Amen. Um, morning, y'all. I uh, hope all is well in your life. If you're new to mission, uh, here's the deal. Pastor Daniel told you already a good deal about us. Uh, we're a Bible church. We love the Bible. We believe from beginning to end it is the Word of God, which means that we're called to obey it, and in obedience is great blessing. It, it may mean good things for you. It may mean suffering, honestly, but what it will always mean is God's presence and His glory, and that's what I want for you this year. So, the passage that Daniel read from First Chronicles, this sets the platform for where we're going to go in First Samuel. And we're going to start a study in First Samuel, Second Samuel. First Samuel alone is going to take us 54 weeks. Uh, some of y'all come from topical churches where they just skip around. I don't know. When I, want, when I watch a movie, I want to watch it from the beginning to the end. Okay? Certain sitcoms, if you come in halfway through, you don't know what the heck's happening. And so in the Bible, this is going to begin in the beginning, and we're going to see a nation that is basically a bunch of tribal formations become this mighty kingdom. And we're going to see the end of the judgment phase, talk a little bit about Samson today, then we're going to see uh, Samuel become the last, I'll give you a hint, judge uh, and the first prophet, Okay. And we're going to see him struggle. We're going to see him in the future be under some leadership that the leadership loves God and yet has, makes mistakes. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Any of you love God and make mistakes? Uh, we're in good company, okay? And then we're going to see some generational things. And here's the deal. We're going to read First Chronicles together again, but you're going to read it with me. If we can get down in the theme of chapters 1 through 7, really the whole Bible, but potentially uh, in a greater way, chapters 1 and 7 uh, in 1 Samuel. If we can understand and comprehend the sovereignty of God, everything changes. Now, this is not the how to have your best life ever or any of that kind of stuff. I'm just telling you, when hard times come, sovereignty of God will save you. When the best days of your life happen, sovereignty of God will keep you from thinking you're the reason for the blessing. And, and it's just as important. It's just as important because you can be a great moral family and teach your kids that everything is up to you. Now, there's a responsibility. I'm a pull myself up by my bootstraps kind of guy too. But in days of blessing, to God be the glory. In days of suffering, to God God be the glory. So this is our platform for everything. So uh, pull up First Chronicles again. We're going to read it. Um, I love corporate reading. I grew up in a church that had stained glass and pews in it. Pews are where we sat. If you're new to church, I know that sounds weird. We sat in pew. But anyway, um, we're going to read this together. And we're going to come back to a precept of fellowship, not this preference Namby pamby weirdo stuff in churches today that God is just for you and he's your buddy and he wants everything good to happen for you. No, God is sovereign and everything is his. And because of that, the only space that you can occupy and not be a heretic is under his authority. Not to the side, not over him. The Trinity is not waiting for you to make a decision. The Trinity is calling you to obey what God has decided. So let's read this. This is David speaking. David had a lot of sin issues, but he was also a prayer warrior. So there's hope for us sinners in the room that struggle with normal everyday stuff. We can pray. We can beg the Lord. We can come to the Lord. We can confess to the Lord. We can repent to the Lord and we can have a life that's under his authority. So let's read together. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel. Now we're going to start again. <laughs> nine o'clock just blew y'all out of the water. And you don't want to take that from the nine o'clock. They already get up earlier than you. Okay. So let's take, let's read this together. Nice and loud. Okay. Here we go. And David said, yes, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our father forever and ever yours, O Lord is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. 
Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. We thank you, O God, for all that you have given us. We thank you, O God, for whatever you've taken from us. We thank you, O God, for the best days. And we, we need you and we love you, O God, in the hardest days. All greatness, all power, glory, victory, majesty, kingdoms, riches, honor, rule, strength, gratitude, and praise, all are God's. Secondarily, they may be yours. Primarily, they are his. He is the owner. There's no room in there for you. So we're going to see in this nation in transition in Israel that begins with Samuel, uh, begins with this, these first few chapters. We're going to see the end of Judges, last one Samuel, the beginning of the prophets, first one Samuel. And the key theme in those seven chapters is this. And this is not, by the way, how you build a giant church saying verses like this, but it is how you obey what Scripture says. Here's what it says. The one and only sovereign God does not serve us. We serve him. We serve him. Blessed be the name. Lord, I don't know what you're going to do with this person. Blessed be the name. Lord, I don't, we don't know how to pay the bill tomorrow. Blessed be your name. Lord, we have more than we've ever had before. Blessed be your name. Yours, Lord, not mine. Yours. All right, so we better go ahead and get the sermon started. It's 22 minutes. Okay, let me pray. Uh, Christians, ask the Lord right now to give you an aha moment from the word of God. You may have read it a lot. I get it. Don't be the I know Christian. Be the teach me Christian. Okay, let's learn. Uh, Lord, uh, speak as only you can. Holy Spirit, fill up this room with your presence. Uh, Lord, we ask conviction of souls today. I pray right now for those that don't know you and that are here, they, they are welcome to be here, Lord. We, we have no fingers pointed at them at all. Uh, Lord, give us the honor of sharing with them the glory in you we've seen. Give us the honor, Lord, of sharing the riches you've given us for them. Uh, teach us, Lord. Open our eyes, open our hearts. Lord, I lift up Christians right now. Some of them, some of us are crusty and hard and callous. Knock us to the ground, Lord. Open our eyes that we might see. Put us in a formation of prayer on the floor that we might recognize that you alone are Lord of heaven and earth. And you have loved us through your son, Jesus. You have given us opportunity to receive from you salvation that can never be removed away in accordance with Old Testament and New Testament scripture. We love you, Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. here we go. First Samuel. Verse 1, there was a man from Ramathame Zophim in the hill country of Ephraim. His name was Elkanah, son of Jor Jorahom, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. Um, ladies that are pregnant, there's some names for you. Love to see little baby Zoph running around, little Tohu. He had two wives, the first name Hannah and the second uh, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah was childless. Elkanah, who is this guy? Now, there's some similarities between Elkanah and a man named Manoah. Do you know whose father Manoah was? Samson. Now, those of y'all that are churchies, that means you're raised in the church. Raise your hand if you're a churchy. You remember the story of Samson? He had really dark hair, and he was very white for some reason in the stories I read. He was a Nazarene, a Nazarite. He never cut his hair, was not supposed to cut his hair, didn't drink alcohol, and he was set, a, set apart from God. Samuel was also called to be a Nazarite, okay? So here, if you read, pull up my little graph. I'm a graph guy. Those of y'all that are new, I love to do this stuff. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. It's going to happen more. Um, Judges 13, 2 through 5 is the beginning of Samson. 
He was a judge that happened about 80 years before Samuel did, okay? Um, somewhere in that regard. And um, he, he, Samson came to the power of a judge around, uh, around 20, 25 years old. So here's how the scripture begins, how there's someone. There was a certain man, that's how Judges opens up. First Samuel, there's a certain man named Elkanah, named Manoah, name of hometown, Zora, name of hometown for Samuel, uh, Rama, Ramathame. Now, where I come from in North Carolina, super hillbilly, super country, okay, dogs in the back of trucks, a lot of overalls, that's all I'm going to say, okay? Now, where I come from, when people ask you, where are you from, I said this all the way to where I got to Texas. Then I stopped after people laughed at me. They're like, uh, in North Carolina, where are you from? I'm from Haywood County. You would identify your people group of where you came from. And I got to Texas and somebody said, where are you from? And I named my county and they're like, man, you are from the country, aren't you? Like, why'd you tell me that? Okay. Where you're from tells a lot about who you are. Okay. So, um, Samson comes from the tribe of Dan, warlike tribe. Samuel comes from the tribe of Levi, Levitical, the priestly tribe. Okay. Um, Manoah's wife was childless, couldn't have a baby. Samuel's wife, I mean, Elkanah's wife was childless, couldn't have a baby. Both their sons were called to be Nazarites. Now, why is this important? It's the beginning of a theme of God's sovereignty in this book. That he does not owe you an explanation for why he decides to do certain things. He doesn't owe you a reason for why you're called to obey. What you owe him is, yes, Lord. And I, I know it's harder than it, it sounds. It's definitely harder in my life. Um, his plan, not your plan. Our life as believers must be, what is your plan, O oh God? Not, this is my plan, bless me, O oh God. The second one is not it. The first one is your will be done. Verse three, this man Elkanah would go up from his town every year to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of armies, which is one of my favorite names of God in scripture, the Lord of armies. In other scriptures, it says the Lord of angel armies. And uh, listen, that's a whole different level. So for those of y'all that are new to the church, an angel is not a precious moments character. Little, little seven-year-old boy. It's a mighty being that is more powerful than you and hundreds of thousands of people fully armed. He is smarter than you. He is theologically more sound than you. And he lives and breathes to worship his king. He's ready all the time. Lord, your will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done. Angels are an example. They're not to be worshiped. But this is... Uh, this sacrifice to the Lord of armies, which at that time they didn't even know it was Jesus. At Shiloh were Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Now, those of you that are pregnant, do not use these two names. N not, really, not really good. You'll see later in the story where the Lord's priest. They lived in Ramathame Zophim, traveled to Shiloh, pull up the map. I'm a map guy too. I got to see what we're talking about here. Now, this is a portion of Israel. Israel, I think when we see the news, it's just some flat wasteland. It's actually beautiful and mountainous. Okay, so when you see the green, that's the lower down plains. And then when you see it begins to change kind of greenish to light brown, that's higher up in the mountains. So where Rama is right there, about 12 miles east is Shiloh, where they went to offer sacrifices and to feast. 12 miles. Now that for you and I, depending on how fast you drive, is 10 to 15 minutes. For them, it was two days. Two days of walking with children, okay, to get to that space. They did this a couple times of, year, of the year. Higher up in the mountains, it was all uphill on the way there and all downhill on the way back. Verse 4, whenever Elkanah offered a sacrifice... He always gave portions of the meat to his wife, Penina, and to each of her sons and daughters. Sons, plural. Daughters, plural. So at least they had four kids, at least. Okay? Hannah had zero. The other wife had at least four. When you see that he gave portions of the meat, it meant that he was well off enough to not only afford the trip, but to also afford a good sacrifice. Okay? Uh, well-off man, two wives, multiple children, able to give generously to the temple. Very good. Verse five, 
But he gave a double portion to Hannah, for he loved her even though the Lord had kept her from conceiving. Now, the Lord had kept her from conceiving. We'll come back to that. But I want to talk about the first part here. Hannah was his favorite. And let me just tell you, church, when you play favorites, trouble ensues. When you play favorites, really in almost any medium, what we see, and I can send you an abundant amount of verses if you want them this week, about God looking at us and not saying, well, you do this and you do that, so I like you more. He looks straight at our heart. He's interested in who we are. He loves us with an everlasting love. And he responds to who we are in our heart, not in what we have on the outside. Um, give you a few examples of favoritism in the Bible. We'll just go with the, with the big ones. Abraham with Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael born first, 10, 15 years behind Isaac. Ishmael was called uh, the, the child of the flesh, and, and, and Isaac was called child of the covenant. Uh, there's a preference there, okay? Passed it on to their son Isaac with Jacob and Esau. Uh, definitely issues, problems. What came about in that favoritism, anger, almost violence, almost murder. And then uh, the end one, Jacob with Joseph and his brothers. Jacob was very clear that he loved Joseph, one of the youngest at that time, the youngest, more than the others. He's open about it. Remember, he gave him a coat of, thank you, thank you, churches, right? Yeah, just multiple colored coat. Joseph was the one that came back to his brother and said, hey, y'all had a dream. All y'all going to worship me one day. Have a good one. Okay. The brothers hated him. And at the end, they tried to murder him. His life was barely saved. He was put into slavery. Uh, and in the end, what he dreamed came true. That's another story. Now, this word favoritism, this is the word uh, yeah, in Hebrew, uh, prosopolepsia, which sounds like it should come with a prescription. Amen. How you doing, bro? I got some prosopolepsia. Ooh, I'm sorry. Let's pray, pray for you in discipleship group. Um, here's, here's what it means. It means that you have a preference based on outward appearance. That sound familiar yet? Social ranking, talent, capacity, and abilities. Um, which means this is prejudice is what it is. Parents, you got to be careful in your homes right now because if you have... If you have more than one kid, you'll notice that they have different personalities. Amen? Amen? They're different. And so you're looking at one going, this one right here, he's just like me. He sounds like me. He does what I do. The other one doesn't know where his shoes are. Like, I'm a little bit of favoritism there. Uh, it's dangerous because what happens with favoritism is there begins to be animosity and anger. And some of you are on the negative end of that. Um, it's not only prejudice, it's discrimination. I mean, this is what people groups do. You're a different color. I don't like your outside. I don't like who you are. You're a different political affiliation. Therefore, I don't really have to love you because I'm a Christian and the Christians only vote this way. Uh, you, you don't have as much as I do and you're really, your life is kind of icky and I'm not sure what to say. Or you've done some horrible things. Therefore, I don't have to love you based on where you've been. It's favoritism. Um, this is why porn is a killer for men or for women. It's a comparative evil sin. You're looking at multiple people and you're putting together this conglomerate of what you think is the perfect person and your spouse can never live up to that person. This is why emotional ties with the opposite sex outside of your marriage is not a good thing. Comparisons will kill you. Well, you know, he, he listens to me. Well, you know, she laughs at all my jokes. Well, you know, they do this, they do that. My spouse doesn't. And you, you, have, you have dropped your, your, your process of looking to the Lord, your one in sovereign control over your life, into people that cannot help your placement. It's like an addiction. We discriminate against ourselves with comparison to others instead of a focus on Christ and his call over our lives. This is why understanding sovereignty of God is a mature action. It's not for children in the faith. It's for adults. So believer, if you are a mature believer, where are you in terms of your comprehension and your, your belief in God's sovereignty? Verse 6, 
her rival, Hannah's rival, Penina, would taunt her severely just to provoke her. Anybody ever been taunted? It's just horrible. Being called names, maybe, in front of other people. Elementary school is a horrible place where that happens. So is high school, so is college. By the way, those of y'all that are that age, so is your 30s, your 40s, your 50s. People just do it more secretively, okay? It's called gossip. Um, it's the same thing. Um, she would be taunted just to provoke her. Here's where if you look at verse 5, the Lord had kept her from conceiving. Then Samuel, who potentially was the predominant writer of the first part of 1 Samuel, writes about his mother, talking about himself, right? Because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving. So who kept Hannah from having a baby? God did. Okay. So if you have been blessed, it's nothing you have accomplished yourself. It is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. Hardships can be brought on through bad choices. We know that from Scripture. Reap what you sow. We understand these principles. But what about this situation? Had she done anything not to have conceived. Um, in this day, lack of conception was solely the issue of the woman. It was her fault. It obviously, it wasn't Elkanah's fault. We know now modern biology, it can be the man or the woman that, that keeps a couple from conceiving. Uh, why did God keep her from having a baby? We don't know. Here's the deal. Sometimes you're not going to know. And as an adult, you have to realize, I'm asking the Lord for the answer, and he's not told me. He's still God. And I need to bring myself into that space. I was talking to two of my friends before service, way smarter than me. Honestly, they're way smarter than most of y'all. And they, they're just different level. Do you have intelligence, friends? Maybe you're that person. There is a giant blessing of intelligence, right? You know things other people don't. There's a giant downside to be intelligent too. You question everything, even when the answer's right there. And that's where simple folk have one up on you. Simple folk are able to go, this is the situation. Okay. And the intelligence person, I don't know, I need to whiteboard this for about five years. And then we'll figure out nine different things to do, discount those and come up with another list. Okay. There's a simplicity here. Okay. Her rival would taunt her because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving. We don't know. John 1, 9, 1 through 3. I'll read this verse to you. Uh, may help you. It's one of my favorite. Uh, Jesus is, this blind man approaches Jesus. Here's what happens. As he was passing by, Jesus passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, Rabboni, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? It was common knowledge, or so they thought at that moment, that if you had a handicapped child, you had done something wrong. If you had a blind child, somebody that had issue with leg problem, skin, hair, whatever, you've done something wrong. If something happened to an individual, some type of maiming or crippling, you did something wrong. So you became kind of castigated in your community because obviously this little blind boy, parents had done something wrong. So the disciples are just asking him, uh, who sinned, this man or his parents? He was born blind. Verse 3, neither this man nor his parents sinned. Jesus answered, in terms of the blindness, like obviously they were sinners, like you and me, this came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. Now, he saw a grown man that was blind. That's what history records. He wasn't like blind for a little bit and gained his sight back. He was blind since a child, which means that he couldn't go into the temple. Uh, potentially he wasn't married. Potentially he couldn't earn a good wage. Why had God allowed that type of travesty to happen to a child? So that God's works might be displayed in him. Blind from birth. Did the baby deserve this? No, but I don't think, I don't think the Trinity was waiting for the family to decide that. God's works might be displayed in him. We must follow this to its natural conclusion, though. If all things are allowed or caused by God's sovereignty... For his glory, then all things. Your situation, my situation, what you're struggling with, what, what your family is struggling with, it is not an unknown entity to the God of the ages. 
It is within that sovereignty. Uh, Romans 8, 28, you see that passage differently. Um, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are all called, called according to his purpose. Now, again, if you've been raised in the church, you see that verse like, yeah, no, that's a good verse. And you put it in the good verse category. You don't put it, tend to put it in the application category. If you're new to the if you're new to the church and you see that verse, it's like, wow, wait a minute. This is huge. Now, I want, you, I want to tell you the key to this verse, and churches, maybe you've not noticed this before. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Now, has God loved you? He, he, all of us have seen his grace. Romans 1, clearly. No one is outside. No one has an excuse. God has revealed himself through others, through the word, through nature. He has revealed himself to the individual way out in the bush, to the person that was raised in the lap of luxury. Now, the key of this, God's love for you is of no question, right? What about your love for him? For the good of those who love God. So the, the key this year to struggles and phenomenally good times us learning to love the God who has loved us. That's the key right here. Loving the Lord in all moments. Reading scripture in a way that now I had somebody tell me between services, well, I've read the Bible a lot and then I've gone and done this act. I hear you. You can read the Bible. But man, are, are you coming hungry to the word of God? Like, why do we read the Bible, church? Because you're supposed to? I mean, really, it's, it's, the, it's the answer you have in your mind. No, it's because you need to. You need to be hungry. There's some answers there for you. Even in this first 10 verses of 1 Samuel, I'm blown away by God's sovereignty. It is overarching everything. And remember, there's nothing that falls outside of its care, of its power, and of its glory. That means whomever is going to be elected this fall, God's already decided that. Whatever the government is in our state, God's already decided that. Your tomorrow, your next year, your next week, God has already decided that. We are called according to his purpose. Verse 7, year after year. So they, they did this for many years, already multiple children. Now this is the years following. Maybe, maybe Penina had more children. Year after year when she went up to the Lord's house, her rival taunted her in this way. Golly, and they live in the same house. Hannah would weep and would not eat. So what do we see here? Real pain, real issues, real tears, real suffering. Like, I don't, uh, your suffering is real, church. Mine is real. Let's, let's stop denying it when we go through hard times. Well, everybody else suffers, not me. No, no, suffering's real. Like, accept that. But accept, accept it within the context of where you are. Was, ever, was Hannah ever told by God why she had suffered this way? No. Nope. Neither was Job. What they did not have, though, we have today. You know what we have today that they didn't have? Technology is one. We do have that. We also have their story. We have their story. We have scripture. So listen, there's more responsibility on your plate than there was on theirs. Were they responsible? Yes, that's between God and them. But I'm telling you, as a fellow believer, that we have the story of God showing his sovereignty and his love and care in hard moments Therefore, we're called to respond the same. He may let us know why, but then again, he may not. Okay? Verse 8, Hannah, why are you crying? Now, this is, I think this is a funny verse in Scripture. I think it's hilarious. I think it shows the grace we all need in our marriages. Amen? Say that before I read it. Okay. Hannah, why are you crying? Her husband Elkanah said. Elko would ask, why won't you eat? Why are you troubled? Here we go. You ready, ladies? Am I not better to you than 10 sons? The answer is obviously no. No, you're not. Now, I don't know if she said that off record, okay? Maybe she did. As husbands and wives talk in private, you know, we, we discuss hard things. The, the, the irony of this is when Elkanah was married to Hannah, Hannah could not conceive Therefore, Hannah was obviously not worth more than 10 sons. He went out and got another wife. And that's where the division and problem and issue began. Okay? Um, 
We'll finish up on verse 9. On one occasion, Hannah got up after they ate and drank at Shiloh. The priest, Eli, was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. You'll see him, you'll see him um, more clearly next week. Deeply hurt, Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears. I'd listen, I'd say this to you. Um, two things. One, if you're deeply hurt and you're troubled and, and, you, and, you, and you're sad, cry before the Lord. Weep before the Lord. Talk to the Lord. I, 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 was, I was driving here today. I'm in Exodus and my own Bible reading time. And uh, it was just so awesome. But I paused it and had a question. And this is what my prayer sounded like. I didn't pray in King James. So some of you may. That's cool. I was like, I paused and I had a question. I was like, yeah, but Lord, what, what about this situation? Like, I don't know what to do here. And I, I, I just, I'm begging you for your answer, Lord. You know how many times I prayed that on that specific thing? Give you my word, like two or 300 already. Got to knock. You got to go to the one who has the answers, not to your friends who kind of maybe have an answer. When friends come to you, the answer you give them is Christ. Let's go to the Bible. Let's see what it says. Let me do this with you. If you're in, in tears and in suffering, go to the Lord and bang on the door and seek him. Scripture says, you know, knock, the door will be open. It doesn't say how long you have to knock. <laughs> Maybe I knock for a while. Let's get tenacious in here. Those of you who are under 30, that means anything longer than five seconds. <laughs> Bang on the door, okay? Lord, the Lord, Scripture shows, is a huge fan of tenacity and follow through. And, and, and just and, and we being weathered under some pain. Here's the flip side. I would say this to you also. When abundance happens, and I pray that for you. I don't pray it for you all the time because it changes you on the inside and the out. But when abundance happens, when you get a good raise, when things are happening well, when, I mean, your kids are flourishing, your marriage is flourishing, in those moments, go to the Lord in tears too and say, thank you, Lord. This is all because of you. This is all because of you. And I love you because of it. And I know that you give and that you take away. But blessed be your name, Lord. And as the body, we're strengthened when we do this together. You're not the only one that has a problem. You're not the only one that's being blessed right now. You're, the not, you're not the only one that's praying and not received an answer yet. You're not the only one who's prayed and answers have been given. Let's share. Let's connect. Let's do these things all for the glory of God. We have... Uh, we had a baptism this morning after nine, which is super cool. Uh, young Haitian man, his, his mother was baptized last week. Uh, we, we, we baptized Chadley this morning at the, at the nine. And now we have another baptism. Looking forward to that. So let's pray. We'll do communion. Um, come down the center aisle. Communion team, come on up. Come down the center aisle. Receive the bread, which represents Christ's body. Live for you, broken for you. Receive the juice, which symbolizes his blood shed for you, that you might come to the Father through the Son and receive forgiveness and be loved. And now you can love him in return and begin a mature relationship with God, not a childlike relationship, not knowing, but being, being an adult, eating meat, responding to the Lord. When you're ready, church, come on down front. If you're not a believer, stay in your seat. Communion is for believers only. If you need a minute or two to pray and confess sin and repent, just ask God for help. Do that and then come down front. Amen.